Work. Most of us spend over half our lives at work. Whatever it is you fill the nine to five with, planting crops, building cars, taking care of patients, teaching students, or running a business. Work is where most of life happens. For some, work is a drain. They dread Monday mornings, forcing themselves to struggle through because they need the paycheck, while many times feeling trapped and beaten down by their job. Some people love their work. They're good at what they do. It energizes them. It's a place of security, a place to chase dreams, desires, and success. At work, they find fulfillment. We often forget to connect our faith to our work. We don't consider the reasons God may have us at our job. We don't think about the purpose and meaning we could bring to our work. We simply focus on how it makes us feel. But what if we saw our work as an opportunity to worship? As Christians, we are called to serve Christ with our lives. For a few, that means working as a pastor, a youth minister, or a missionary. Others serve the church by teaching children or singing in the choir. But when Sunday is over, most of us return to our jobs outside the church. For us, our mission is in the marketplace. We may not be the kind of missionary who moves to the far regions of Africa, but around the conference table, around the water cooler, or around the cubicle, we have an opportunity to worship the God who created us. He gave us skill. He gave us passion. He gave us work. When we do our jobs with excellence and integrity and diligence, it's an act of worship. We are displaying God's craftsmanship to the non-believing world around us. We are earning the right to be heard. We don't see a divide between Sunday and Monday, between the sacred and the secular. We've been invited into parts of the world that a pastor or traditional missionary will never see. We have conversations with people who would never set foot in a church. Whether we love or dread our work, we choose to turn the focus away from ourselves and towards the mission God has for us. Church is not the only place we worship, and Sundays are not the only days on our calendars that have meaning. Every day on mission for God brings us great joy. Like the heroes before us, we can be modern day Noah's and Joseph's and Peter's who are called with a purpose. God has designed us. He created us to work and to worship. For us, work is worship. On February 23, 2018, over 2,000 churches across the country are hosting the first ever Work as Worship retreat. Please join us and other business leaders from your church and community. Speakers will include Patrick Lencioni, Matt Chandler, Joel Manby, Phil Fisher, and many more. Tickets are only $25 at www.workasworshipretreat.org. We'll see you there. Uh, well, t today our theme is work, and I, I want to uh, talk about what is, what is God's original design and intent for human work. And this morning I'm going to give you five points that sum up what the Bible says about work. And these five points won't say all that needs to be said in this important topic, but in these five points, these will provide, a, uh, I think, a, a, a theological framework from which we can establish a game plan for our work that will uh, lead to human flourishing and to God's glory. And the first point is this, work is good. Or for you Bible students, work is pre-fall. People assume that work maybe is about the fall of humanity or it's a part of the curse. It's an unfortunate element of human life. But the fact is that work predates the fall, that uh, work was part of God's design in creation. Genesis 1:26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God created all things and declared that all things created are good. And this word created is used multiple times in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. 
Humans are made in the image of God, so we are designed to create, to invent, to make, to produce, to design, and to engineer. So God gave humans their very first task here, be fruitful and multiply, create little human beings. And Adam says, great, I love my job. And then God says, rule over the fish and the birds and the animals. And Adam says, great, this is fantastic. And Genesis 2.15, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to what? To work it and take care of it. And this too was good work. The humans take care of creation and they delight in their work. And even today, all work is God's way of caring for his creation. And so whether you work in a restaurant or an accounting firm or in entertainment or education or healthcare or in manufacturing, you are contributing to human flourishing. That's what this is about. Remember, Adam didn't just tend the garden. Remember, he had that kind of brief stint in marketing where he got to name the animals, and uh, that had to be pretty fun. God brought each animal to Adam, and whatever he named the animal, that was its name. And so he was the guy that got to say, dog. Um, cow, uh, platypus, you know, and he, and he got to create. Now, God did not need Adam to do that job. God is quite capable of naming the animals all by himself, but God created us in his own image, and God loves to create and build, and so God lovingly shares that task with his children. God invites us to create and cultivate, and it is good. We tend to complain about our work. And in fact, work as we experience it today is not fully what God designed for it to be. It does have a curse attached to it. And this curse is broken in part. And one day it will be broken in full. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But as we consider God's perspective on work, uh, we have to remember this, that God put work in paradise. God put work in paradise. That ought to tell us what God thinks about work. Now, some of you are thinking, but wait a minute, paradise is not working. But people who are unable to work because of disability or because of health or job loss, they will tell you the loss of work is way deeper than just the loss of income. And in fact, retirees, uh, most retirees I know still work in their families, in their church, in their community, with or without pay, because we were made for productivity. We were made for contribution. That's point number one. Point number two, work is worship. Work and worship come from the same root word. Read with me aloud Colossians 3, 23 and 24. These are phenomenal words from the Bible. Let's read this aloud together. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever you do, do it as if for the Lord. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. So the glory of God is not just something that we do on Sunday mornings when we're together. It's something we do in everything. So we could say that everything is worship. And that certainly includes your working lives, which will consume the majority of the time of our lifetimes. We worship through work when we recognize that we are actually serving God and bringing Him glory. Next point, work is not to be worshipped. Work is worship, but work is not to be worshipped. One of the problems with work post-fall is that work begins to define us and control us. And we give to our work a power over us it was never intended to have. We look to work to tell us who we are and what we are worth. And the biblical word for this is idolatry. Now, a lot of you know that in the Old Testament, idolatry took a very physical form. People would build golden statues and they would bow to it. But in the New Testament and beyond, we see that idolatry is very broad. An idol is anything in your life that occupies that space reserved for God. An idol is anything in your life that occupies that space reserved for God alone. 
And we know that everything tends toward idolatry. Our romantic lives tend toward idolatry. Our financial lives tend toward idolatry. Our political lives tend toward idolatry. And certainly our working lives tend to toward idolatry. The great reformer John Calvin said the human heart is an idol-making factory. And that's really uh, true. Your identity and your value come from God alone, not from your job. Your job has a role in your life, and the role of God is not available. These are the first two of the great Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, and don't make an idol Uh, Don't make any idols. All right, I'm going to move on uh, to the next point. Uh, Work is affected by the fall. Work is affected by the fall. Now, we've already said this in a variety of ways, but I want you to see exactly what God said right after Adam and Eve rebelled against God, after sin entered the world. Uh, The Bible in Genesis 3 records what God said specifically to Adam and then to Eve, and then God even speaks to the serpent, the tempter who led them astray. Uh, in Genesis 3.17 to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife, no comment, and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So work, which was created good, will now become difficult and frustrating. Work will become labor. Human life will become temporary. Humans will die. And to the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Childbirth will become painful. The harmony between the man and the woman is broken, and now men will rule over women. This is part of the human curse. God also speaks to the serpent to the one who encouraged them to to go astray and eat the forbidden fruit. God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is a foreshadowing of Jesus that Jesus one day will strike the head of the evil one, destroying the curse. This is all in Genesis chapter 3. And it actually gets worse. In Genesis chapter 4, all the children become known only by their occupations. They become identified by their jobs. And this kind of builds to Genesis chapter 11, where they build the Tower of Babel. They're building a monument to themselves. They're climbing ladders of their success. And so we see work corrupted, people defined by their jobs, work being for human glory rather than for God's glory, and people climbing ladders to prove their self-worth. And Jesus came to redeem us from the curse. Now, a lot of that has already happened. You are more free and have more power than you realize. But the curse will be broken in full in the new heaven and the new earth. Which is why the Bible seems to indicate that there will be work in heaven. I don't know if you thought about that. A lot of people think heaven is going to be like this big retirement center or something. And maybe, maybe it's disappointing to you to think that heaven's going to have work in it. But listen, the work's going to be great because for the first time, you and I will know work free from the curse. We will know meaningful contribution as we co-reign with God in his reign over all of creation. And it's going to be wonderful. And the last point I'll bring up today is this one. The workplace is the greatest place for ministry. There are 40 miracles recorded in the New Testament. 39 of them happen outside of the church, most of them in the marketplace. God's power is not limited to church buildings. The workplace is the ideal place for ministry and healing. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. Let's read this aloud together. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The workplace is a place for ministry and impact, and you are a priest. You are a representative of the living God. And in your workplace, there are people who are lonely and hurting, and God has placed you in that office, in that factory, in that garage, in that school, in that workplace to give them help and hope. You are in a great place for impact. Things are changing globally. We used to send pastors and missionaries to those parts of the world where there are no Christians, where they've never heard about Jesus. But these days, this is getting more difficult. Business people have far more access globally today than do pastors and missionaries. In some languages, in some of these closed countries, the word missionary and the word terrorist are the same word. You think I might change the way you're welcomed? as you greet yourself. So glad to be here. I'm a, I'm a terrorist. Right? It gets harder to send pastors overseas. Sometimes when I travel to certain countries, the host instructs me, don't, don't tell people that you're a pastor. Um, don't, don't, don't outwardly lie, but just kind of don't offer it. Or, uh, so sometimes when I travel, if I'm asked, I'll, I'll say, uh, I'm, I'm a counselor, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm an underwear model. I try to think of something believable. Um, <laughs> You know, it's not too much of a, of a stretch. <laughs> 1.7 billion people in the world today have never heard the name of Jesus. Most of them live in what's commonly called the 1040 window, you know, guarded by the latitude and longitude. So ten, the 1040 window uh, has most of those people. There are currently 40,000 missionaries serving inside the 10, 1040 window. 40,000 missionaries. Isn't that great? 40,000 people have moved there. Uh, to share Christ and hope and grace. But there are two million Americans living there because of secular employment. Two million Americans live there. And even if the national average is true and 36% of them self-identify as Christians, let's say even only 10% of them are really serious about their faith, uh, we could increase the mission force in the world from 40,000 to 240,000 without any uh, increase in cost. International business people are best positioned to represent Jesus globally, to unreached people groups, and people in any kind of job are best positioned to bring help and hope to people at their point of need. So if you're feeling restless and unfulfilled at work, the answer is not to get a stand-up desk. The answer is to get God's perspective on work, and then we can develop a game plan. And I hope some of you can join us for the Work as Worship retreat happening on Friday, February 23rd. That's not this Friday, but the following Friday. Registration is open now. God created work. And through your work, fallen as it may be, you can know the joy of meaningful contribution. You can minister to other people. And you can serve and worship God and you can bring God glory. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for all of creation, and that includes each other. Help us to live out your purposes in this world. Help us to seek and know you. Forgive us the times we have slipped into idolatry, for the times we've gotten caught up in ladder climbing and name building for the times we have been ungrateful and complaining. May our lives be so much more than just a game, but may it be a divine call. To you be all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.